Hello and welcome to the who, what, where, how, and why of the happiness movement. My name is Laura Musikansky. I'm with the Happiness Alliance. Since 2010, we have been providing tools and resources for people like you to become leaders in the happiness movement. This is one of those resources and we'll talk about some of the tools in this module. So I am going to explain to you an overview of the happiness movement. And once you're done with this presentation, you will have a roadmap or a la idea of the landscape of the happiness movement to delve much more into it and to learn more. You'll find lots more information at happycounts.org, H-A-P-P-Y-C-O-U-N-T-S dot O-R-G uh, to learn more about this part of the happiness movement. First, you're probably asking, what the heck is the happiness movement? And I will tell you that in a nutshell, it is a paradigm shift. It is going from a society where happiness matters most, where your happiness, the happiness of the people you love, the happiness of everybody around you is what matters most and where happiness is what we value most. And what is, how does that look different from the current system where we have, where we have, where we have in which what we value the most is how rich somebody is or how much somebody has or how beautiful they are. This is very different than valuing how happy somebody is. So when we talk about the happiness movement, one of the precepts of the happiness movement is measurements. And I'm going to talk a little bit about measurements and then bring that back in to, in, at the end of this to why it is that measurements matter in this paradigm shift and what they mean to you in your own personal life. So this is the why of the happiness movement. And the why is that measurements matter, that what you measure is what you get, that what you measure is what you care about. So right now, what we're measuring and what we're getting is profit for companies, gross domestic product for nations and money or wealth for people. What is gross domestic product? Gross domestic product is the sum of all goods and services produced within a time period. So this is these are the measurements that we're getting, and then the, the outcome that we're getting is we're getting more and more economic growth. Now, let's do a little bit of a reflection in, the, in that where does gross domestic product come from? Well, it used to be called gross national product, and it was devised by somebody named Simon Kuznets who was hired by the U.S. Congress during the Great Depression to help Congress to manage the nation out of the Great Depression. At that time, Congress had this one measurement for the economy, and that was they counted the railway cars that left the station. And they knew this wasn't a good enough measurement. So Simon Kuznets came up with gross domestic at that time, gross national product. And it's really important to note that he told them when he delivered this measurement that the welfare of, na of a nation can scarcely be inferred from the measurement of national income. Well, Congress was able to manage the nation out of the Great Depression and also manage us through World War II and then continued to use that measurement, as did all of the nations now since World War II. All of the nations, except, um, with the exception of Bhutan, we'll talk about that, have been using some form of gross domestic product as the main measurement for their economy and for their government and for the society. Well, recently, in 2009, the past French President Sarkozy commissioned these three gentlemen, Stieglitz, Sen, and Bertuzzi, all economists, to look at what is the reality of the situation with us using GDP for so long. And they found that, in fact, the reality of the situation is that things are not looking so good in our economy. We have continued to have growing inequality, and more and more unfairness, more and more pollution, issues with climate change. And there was a call to for a new kind of measurement. This call was responded to with the United Nations in 2011, which adopted this resolution, Happiness Towards a Holistic Approach to Development. Of backing up this, this call from the United Nations was more findings by more economists, Laird, and as well as Easterlin, who had done research here, this number one, where they looked at 
Here's GDP growing and growing over the years. This is called longitudinal research. And yet happiness, where while it increases a little bit when we're coming up out of poverty, it really just doesn't seem to be increasing and even going down as GDP continues to grow up, which seems completely the opposite of the way that it should be if money really can buy happiness. Also backing up what the United Nations had done in 2011 with their resolution was the work that Bhutan had been doing in using gross, domestic, using gross national happiness, the one nation that kicked off the happiness movement and starting to use gross national happiness as its major measurement of success for the economy, for the society, for the government, as well as looking at the sustainability of our earth and our societies with growing inequality and more and more ecological damage. So here we have this resolution that invites, I'll read this, invites member states to pursue the elaboration of additional measures that better capture the importance of the pursuit of happiness and well-being in development with a view to guiding public policies. So this is asking nations to do this. Now, I still haven't answered that question of why do measurements matter so much? And here's the reason they matter. This is from work by Kasser and Ryan and others. What you measure, what the, what the, what the government measures, so what a national government measures, has a direct relationship to what people value. So when the measurement is GDP or profit, then the value that people have, the values that, that the society has, is wealth and appearance and how much money a person has. And when a nation uses measures such as gross national happiness or something like our happiness index, and we'll talk about other different um, happiness measurements out there, then what people value is happiness, equality, sustainability, what's called generativity or taking care and giving something to the future. So there's a, there's a direct relationship there that when a government changes its measures, the values change. And that's why we live in a world, that's one reason we li live in a world, where if your, your measurement, if your chief measurement of success isn't how much money you make or how good you look or how much stuff you have, then you're going against the grain. So let's look a little bit more about the happiness movement and its roots. So we know that in 19 and 1776, the U.S., not yet the U.S. at that time, issued their Declaration of Independence. And they said in that declaration, it said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all, and I'll say here, people were, are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now take note that when this was, that when this was written, the term of the phrase was pursuit of property, and there was a decision, a conscientious decision to use pursuit of happiness instead, and that this is the purpose of government, is the happiness life, protecting and securing the life, the liberty, and the, and the happiness of people. So now we've gone a little bit about why the happiness movement is important, what it is. Now we'll talk about how, what's, what's happening. So how is happiness measured? We've been talking a lot about happiness measurement. You can have a direct experience of this at happycounts.org and take our happiness index. And when you do that, you'll be experiencing what we call a subjective indicator of well-being. So it's a survey, and it asks you, how are you doing? And you answer those questions, and then you get your own self-assessment of your own happiness, which includes how you feel, how satisfied you are with your life, which is a reflective question, as well as how you're doing around these domains of happiness. So how do you feel about your community, how do you feel about your environment, your government, etc. So I urge you to go to happycounts.org and go ahead and take that survey. So you can measure happiness with subjective indicators and with objective indicators. So the objective indicators are those things that you can count. Here we have jackfruit, but they are also, now certainly they include 
gross domestic product, they include how much money you're making, but they include other pieces too, what your level of education is, how you're, how you're doing in terms of your, your health care services, what your lifetime expectancy is, and other pieces of happiness and well-being. So that's just a little bit about this, and now you just kind of have some of the landscape and you can learn more by going to happycounts.org and seeing some of those resources, including the, including the OECD guidelines for measuring subjective well-being. So now we're going to talk about where. Where is this happening? Now, I mentioned Bhutan earlier, and perhaps you've been to Bhutan, or perhaps you don't even know where it is. So here it is on the map. Now, in 1972, it was a 17-year-old king of Bhutan, when he was asked by a reporter for the Financial Times, what are you going to do to improve your country's gross national product? And we responded, gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. And that was the seed that grew into gross national happiness, where in Bhutan they measure the happiness of people with subjective and objective indicators. They have nine domains. Now, our happiness index is based on Bhutan's happiness, gross national happiness index with their permission. They have nine domains. They included the domain of time use, which was new for people. But here you can see those domains. And each domain is weighted equally. So the economy doesn't matter more than the environment, etc. They have subjective and objective indicators, and the objective indicators are weighted a little bit more. And you can learn more about Bhutan's Gross National Happiness Index and get really into how they measure it, what are some of their techniques, um, and how they're blending these indicators at the grossnationalhappiness.org. So another place that is measuring happiness is the United Kingdom. They were the first in the Western world. And their Office of National Statistics has there's measures of national well-being, and you can see that they have similar domains to in Bhutan. They issue these beautiful reports that you can go to their website and you can see trend data for, very interactive. And they use this at a governmental level for different departments to understand what the well-being is. Happiness and well-being, we'll use those words synonymously. In the United, um, in the European Union, all of the nations are now measuring happiness and well-being in some version of or, or other. Some are using subjective and ob others objective, and many of them are blend. And Eurostat has compiled their domains, or we call it circumstances of well-being, and you can check out how they're using. Uh, indicators to measure ha um, happiness and well-being in rate countries. And then finally, we'll mention that I mentioned earlier the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Now this is the organization that issues those reports that say which nation has a higher GDP. So when you see that China has outstripped the US in terms of its GDP, that information comes from the OECD. Well, the OECD, about 2005, started to get wind that GDP was not a sufficient measure for well-being. And then in 2011, they issued their Better Life Index. And this is really fun. You can go onto their website and you can play with these buttons. Get an idea of which nation you should live in based on what, val what you value most in terms of the domains of happiness and well-being. So let, we'll wrap this up pretty here, here with who's measuring happiness and how is it being measured with uh, this project in Brazil, in Ipetininja, excuse me, in Brazil, where Susan Andrews has worked with governments and schools and universities in a very grassroots level. And there's a beautiful flow here of how they've worked to use measurements to engage communities and then take action to enhance the happiness and well-being of communities, which you can also read about at happycounts.org on our community toolkit. You'll see a report there about how communities are doing with laying out um, very clearly so that you can use this as a model in your community. So now we've talked a little bit about that, and I will mention that we have also worked with many, many communities with many different models for how to use happiness measures, which I will talk about in the nuts and bolts section, the 
of the happiness leadership training in a future video. So what is the happiness movement? We've talked about these measurements and we've talked about the domains, but what do we mean when we say happiness? And we're saying that it's, it's, it's a holistic, it's a comprehensive view of, of well-being and of happiness. And so you have your own idea of what happiness is and everybody else has their own idea. And we, when we talk about happiness, we can encompass all of those. There's three different aspects of it. One is satisfaction with life, which I mentioned earlier, is reflective. It asks, when you ask how satisfied are you with your life these days, you have to think about it a little bit. Um, and that's really good information to understand what, what people, what kind of decisions people will be, ma be making. What these, these, these reflections very much impact our, our decisions of what we're going to do in our relationships, in our jobs, in where we live, and how many children, or if we have children, these kinds of things. And then there's the question about affect, of how, are you, how happy are you feeling right now? You don't have to think about it. You can just say, I'm not happy, or um, I'm happy, whatever, at, at different rates. That's really good information for knowing. Um, it's good information for planners to know what, um, what spaces are, are bring happiness to you. Um, there's other ways to use this data. And then last in this piece, when we talk about this, is eudaimonia. So eudaimonia is the kind of happiness that we were talking about with our Declaration of Independence, the good life. And this is, I think of this as probably um, in a way lagging, but maybe the most important because this is telling you, are you really living your potential? And this is helpful to understand what motivates people. But I think also eudaimonia, the good life, um, are you, do you have a life? Are you living the life that you were born to live? Do you feel that you have purpose, that you have meaning? Are you optimistic? Do you feel good about yourself? This is probably the real deep part of, of what we mean by happiness. And this having a life where you have that, um, have eudaimonia, is supported by all of these other different pieces. It doesn't just happen all by itself. Uh, so there we have a little bit of what we mean by happiness, and we know that these measurements and these ways of thinking influence our decision, they influence our motivation, they influence our environment, and vice versa. It's all connected. You can look at some examples of happiness policies at the Global Happiness and Wellbeing Policy Report um, that's created by the Global Council for Happiness and Wellbeing, as well as a book that I wrote with my colleagues, Aranda Phillips and Jean Crowder, a former member of Parliament of the Canadian government. You can look at both how to integrate happiness into uh, governments in, and how to, um, what are the, some of the tools and the resources that governments can use as well as communities can use to bring about this paradigmatic shift. So this book, The Happiness Policy Handbook, is based on the work that we've been doing in communities, with cities, and with governments since 2010. So we'll keep going. Now we're going to go over the who, the who's who in the happiness movement. And this is, remember, this is a very broad overview, and there are many, many other people. Um, and so we hope that you will use this as a way to really explore who's who in the happiness movement for your own life and also to uh, help bring about this paradigmatic shift. So remember that the happiness movement is really based on the economy. And I think before we go into this part of the who's who, let's kind of think about what does economy, oikos is the, is the um, Greek word for economy, and it means home. So it means it, the, the word economy at its root means taking care of your home. Taking, so that means taking care of the people you love, taking care of the household and your, the, the structure that you're living in. So let's just take that concept and stretch, stretch it out to a nation. So that would mean that we take care of people. We take care of families. We take care of the environment that we are, that we are living in and all of the different components. And so I think this is one of the reasons that many of the who's who in the happiness movement are economists because they really get it that the economy is not just about money, that it's really about 
creating a place where people can really thrive. And so one of the people I want to point you to is Martin Durand, who is the, um, the head, the chief statistician for the OECD. She took up after Enrico Giovannini had created the Better Life Index with a man named John Hall, who's now at the United Nations Sustainable Development Program. So she's one, and you can look at that that uh, Better Life Index and some really good reports on their, on their website, as well as the, I mentioned earlier, the uh, OECD guidelines for measuring uh, subjective well-being, which definitively answers the question of whether or not you can measure happiness with a big, huge yes. So John Halliwell, who is a prof uh, professor emeritus at the University of British Columbia. He is the first editor of the World Happiness Report, and he wrote a book, one of my favorites, with Ed Diener called um, Pub Wellbeing for Public Policy. I think that's a really wonderful book if you want to kind of dive into some of the thought leadership in this field. Carol Graham did some very early work and continues to do really important work in how do you measure happiness and what do those measurements mean for government and what are some of the ways that are that it can be used and what are some of the ways that we should be careful about how we use these happiness measurements. Richard Layard, also one of the editors of the World Happiness Reports, he wrote this book, Happiness, and he's the one who you'll see the, that graph that I showed you earlier that shows how GDP increases but happiness doesn't after a certain extent. Rhonda Phillips, she's my co-author for the Happiness Policy Handbook. She has been a community activist and a researcher, has about 25 different books that she's written about community indicators and community well-being indicators. And she's the dean of Purdue Honors College. And Jeffrey Sachs, also one of the editors of the World Happiness Report, and um, does a lot of speaking about the happiness movement all over the world. Joseph Stieglitz I mentioned earlier, so he's done a lot of work around inequality and done a tremendous amount to push forward the happiness movement. And then Daniel Kahneman, who is not an economist, but won a Nobel Prize in, the, in, in, in economics for his work, really about how important that measurement of satisfaction of life is and why economists should be really thinking about that measurement. So this goes to that. This brings us this little bit of some of just a few of the who's who in the happiness movement. Um, so I would ask you to reflect when you have time to think about what is what is the purpose of an economy? Um, what is the purpose of the of an economy for your household? And then thinking about it of what is the purpose of an economy for a nation? Now let's look at some of the psychologists, the positive psychologists in the happiness movement. So we'll start with Ed Diener, who with Carol Graham has worked with Gallup, where they have helped them to develop their, um, their Gallup World Poll. And I mentioned that book earlier that I thought is one of my favorites in the happiness movement, The Wellbeing for Public Policy. He brought that with Hallowell. Um, Sonia Lubomirsky wrote The How of Happiness, and you'll read about some, this is probably one of the better books if you want to really take some of these lessons home. Although I will say that give caution around what she calls the happiness pie. And this is where you hear that only 10% of your happiness has to do with your life circumstances. And that, that that piece of what is your genetic set point and what are your life circumstances and then what is it that you can do in your own life um, is probably a lot fuzzier than she's saying if we look at overarching research. Martin Seligman and Csikszentmihalyi together they were the two people who decided to uh, transition the psychology movement from looking at what makes us ill to what makes us happy, and that's called the positive psychology movement. Seligman has a wonderful website at the University of Pennsylvania where he has lots and lots of different surveys that you can take. And then Jackson and Haley is the one who came up with the concept of flow. So you you know you all know flow, <laughs> because that's when you're like you're in the zone. That's that feeling of being at one with whatever it is that you're doing. And so we'll end here with Barbara Friedrichsen, who has done a wonderful job of popularizing the concept of loving kindness and um, bringing mindfulness and loving kindness and, and done lots of research about how beneficial that is. And we'll end with um, Abraham Maslow, who you've heard about that, um, 
the hierarchy of needs. So Abraham Maslow is probably the one who, if you would say anybody invented positive psychology, did so looking at what makes people happy, what brings about um, self-actualization. I mentioned eudaimonia in a person, but of course it wasn't called that at that time in the 40s when he came up with that concept. So here we have these ideas of Maslow's eudaimonia or self-actualization, and then we have some of the three key findings, I would say, of positive psychology, which are um, three key tools that you can use to be happy. Um, practicing mindfulness, being generous, and practicing gratitude. These are, there are very different practices, and for every single person, um, they would apply them differently, but you can explore what that means for you um, and find if there's a path for happiness in, in one of those. So I leave you with a question on this of what do you think connects psychology with positive psychology? Remember, psychology created by Freud and Jung really focusing on, um, ended up focusing on mental illness. And here we have positive psychology where we're really focusing on what makes us happy and how do we bridge those two, two gaps. Where, and just a couple of other thoughts, which is that if you read the World Happiness Reports and other scholarship, you'll find that there's a real priority being put on mental health care as an intervention for the happiness movement. So that what Jung said, um, what you resist persists, and then that what's, what the positive psychology movement is doing is really teaching the world happiness skills, mindfulness, gratitude, generosity, and many, many others. So what do you think to think about that and have conversations about that? A little bit more about who's who in the happiness movement, and then we'll wrap the segment up. There are many different ways that happiness is being integrated into government. I talked about in Bhutan, where they have the Gross National Happiness Index. They also have happiness in their constitution and a happiness um, ministry. They do something like this in the United Arab Emirates, where they have um, happiness sits in the prime minister's office, and they're integrating happiness into uh, the different ways as well as departments in the governments. And in in um, Dubai, which is one of the states of the United Arab Emirates, they're using happiness measurements, a three-point happiness scale, to determine the satisfaction of all government services, and then using that data to, um, to have a better relationship between how they deliver services and how the happiness and well-being of the people. It's a different kind of government, so many of the services are um, governmental services or semi-private um, services, whereas in other places there's a separation between government and industry. But in any case, it's a very interesting model. And then last, Tony Burton is a consultant working with the New Zealand Treasury, and um, there he has helped them to integrate happiness and well-being measurements as part of their budgeting. So they have a sort of like a participatory budgeting, but it's within the government based on how are you going to use this budget to increase the happiness and well-being of people in, um, in New Zealand. So that's just a few examples. There's lots of different other examples of how governments are working to integrate happiness and into government processes and outputs to make happiness the purpose of governments. So what do you think? So thank you very much for listening to this, and I hope that you learned a lot. You can go to happycounts.org to learn more and look at other videos. Please note that this uh, product, this here is this video, as well as our uh, presentation is copyright with the Happiness Alliance. Please ask for permission for uh, you distributing or using it at happycounts.org. You can reach me, Laura, at happycounts.org. And we hope that you will buy the Happiness Policy Handbook and donate to the Happiness Alliance.